Thanks, Liz. Um, as uh, Liz says, uh, I'm just going to uh, lead you all through uh, a presentation on the forthcoming uh, electoral review of uh, Coventry City Council, um, which actually started uh, on Tuesday this week, um, but I will cover that in this presentation. Uh, there'll be a chance for you to ask uh, any questions and uh, answers at the end. Uh, so if you could um, hold on to your questions to the end and I'll answer um, any questions I have. So um, as I said, I'm here to give you a, uh, a short presentation about the review process, uh, why we are doing it um, and how you can get involved and influence the outcome. So. First, to start a bit about uh, the Local Government Boundary Commission for England. Um, we as a body recommend fair electoral and boundary arrangements for the whole of England. And we are completely impartial. Uh, we do not report to government or any political parties, but instead report direct to Parliament via a committee chaired by the Speaker of the House of Commons. Uh, the Commission is uh, objective. Our recommendations for new electoral arrangements are only based on evidence related to the criteria that are set out in law. We are transparent. We follow clear and open processes uh, and every submission we receive throughout a review is published on our website, um, properly redacted, so that people can see how we've reached our decisions uh, and we publish detailed reports that explain our reasoning. We are responsive uh, to local opinion uh, and we regularly change our recommendations based on what we've heard from local people during consultations. Uh, and we are professional and accessible. Uh, we're very open and very easy to get hold of. Uh, you can email or phone us direct at any point through the review uh, and we will uh, answer and give you any help uh, you need in uh, responding to any of our consultations. So what is an electoral review? Um, an electoral review considers the electoral arrangements for a local authority. This means it looks at the following things. The total number of councillors for an authority. The total number of wards. The location of the boundaries between each ward. The names of each ward and the number of councillors elected to each ward. And at the end of the review, we will make recommendations to Parliament about each of these things in time to be implemented for the next election. So why Coventry? Uh, the Commission has a uh, responsibility in law to review every authority from time to time. Uh, Coventry has not had a review since 2003, so by the time this review is complete, its current boundaries would have been set 21 years ago. And the Commission considers that this is a reasonable interpretation of from time to time. So the process of the review, our review process is split into four phases. Phase one, which has just been completed, is concerned with councillor numbers. Based on the evidence we received during this first phase, the Commission has decided that Coventry should have 54 councillors, which is the same number that there currently is. Following the council size stage, we then moved into our current phase two of the, of the review, uh, which is what started on Tuesday, and this is the awarding arrangements phase. During this stage, we're consulting with the local community, including this meeting, um, to help us draw up a new set of warding arrangements for the city. Once we've proposed our uh, final recommendations as part of the warding arrangements phase, we then move to the third phase, which is the parliamentary process to make the new arrangements law. And then the final phase is implementation, uh, which refers to uh, the election at which the new wards are used for the first time. Um, as I noted, we're currently in uh, phase two 
uh, of this process. And I'll talk a bit more about how this stage works, um, what we're looking for and how you can get involved. So the warding phase of the review process, which we've just started, is based on a lot of consultation with local people. Uh, we don't know your area of Coventry anywhere near as well as the people that live there uh, and the people that represent the wards. Uh, and so we're relying on you uh, and people across your communities to give us your views on a pattern of wards that make the most sense for Coventry. There'll be at least two opportunities uh, for people to give their views on where the ward boundaries should go and what the wards should be called. The first opportunity is right now. Um, the first consultation period on warding patterns opened on Tuesday and runs through until the 31st of July. During this time, we're asking people across Coventry to tell us where you think the new wards should go. Uh, and people can give us ideas for the whole of the city if they like, but we're equally happy to hear ideas about particular neighbourhoods or smaller parts of neighbourhoods. Um, and I'll talk more about the kind of evidence we're looking to receive uh, in a moment. Once the first consultation period has closed, we will go through all of the submissions and evidence we've received. Uh, we will come up to Coventry, uh, we will drive and walk around the city, uh, and we will have a look at how the different proposals we've received fit together on the ground. Uh, we will then come up with a set of draft proposals based on what we've heard. We'll then publish uh, this set of draft proposals uh, and consult on them, giving local people a chance to tell us what we've got right, uh, what we've got wrong, uh, and what they think should change. This second, this second consultation period will open on the 31st of October, uh, and we'll run through until the 22nd of January of next year. And we will publish interactive maps and reports uh, during this consultation outlining how we've reached our draft proposals so that people can understand how we've come up with those suggestions. Once the second consultation has closed, we will then go away, um, read everything, um, assess the evidence we've received during both consultations and make any changes we've been persuaded to make uh, by the views of local people, local representatives and local organisations. We will then publish final recommendations for Coventry in May of 2024. Once the final recommendations have been published, then they are then set and cannot be changed after that point. However, sometimes we may be persuaded to hold a third round of consultations if we want to test some suggestions we've received during the second consultation period, which are very different from those which were originally proposed. This further consultation is usually only restricted to one or two areas um, of the local authority um, if it's needed, but it can help the Commission clarify our thinking if we receive persuasive alternatives during the second round of consultation. So uh, when telling us your views, uh, there are some key things that you should know. We are bound by law to only consider arguments related to three things when drawing up new wards, uh, and we call these our statutory criteria. The first of these criteria is electoral equality. So we will seek to propose wards that mean that each councillor represents roughly the same number of electors. However, we don't demand absolute perfect electoral equality because it's also important that the wards we propose reflect local communities and also use clear and identifiable boundaries, which brings us to the other two criteria. The second criteria is community identities and interests. We will seek to propose wards that keep communities together and reflect the shape of local communities across the city. This is something we heavily rely on local people to tell us about, uh, and I'll talk a bit more about that uh, in a moment. The final criteria is effective and convenient local government. Uh, we will try to propose wards that are coherent and use sensible and identifiable boundaries like major roads, uh, rivers, uh, things like that, uh, and wards that have complete internal road links uh, within them and also that have names that mean something to local people. 
I'll talk uh, a bit more in a bit more detail about each of these three criteria. But before I do, it's important to say that all three of these criteria are equal. Uh, the numbers are not more important than communities or convenient and effective local government. And the Commission's task is to come up with a set of awards that provides for the best balance of all three criteria based on the evidence we receive during consultation. So uh, I'm going to talk a bit more in a bit more detail now about what we mean by electoral equality. Ideally, every councillor would represent the same number of electors. In a perfect world, it would look something like this. However, over time, a number of things can happen in the area uh, which alter the number of electors different councillors represent. For example, you might see a number of houses being built in some wards, uh, bringing new electors to uh, some wards, but not others, and not in equal amounts. You might also have uh, a university uh, with new accommodation or increased rates of electoral registration in some wards, which lead to more electors in some wards, uh, but not others. You may have people who leave the area, um, altering the number of electors in some wards. And you might have people moving from one part of the city to another part of the city. Um, so you can see how an area may become imbalanced over time. We will try and ensure that this imbalance does not occur again too quickly when we draw up the new boundaries for the city. To do that, we work with the council's officers to come up with a set of electorate forecasts for each polling district in the city. Uh, and the idea behind this is to try and future proof electoral equality for each ward that we propose for a period of five years from the end of the review. Uh, the forecasts for Coventry have now been published uh, on our website on the dedicated page for the Coventry Review. And our aim is to propose a set of wards that will have uh, electoral equality within 10% uh, of the average uh, for the city by uh, 2029. So moving on to the second criteria of community identities and interests. As I mentioned, it's just as important to the Commission in proposing new wards to reflect local communities. Um, it's obvious to the Commission um, that you as, as local residents and local representatives know your area far better than we do. And so we're relying on you to tell us about the shape of local communities and how they should be reflected within a warding pattern. A sense of community is often shaped by the amenities and services people use, as well as local groups and organisations. Uh, and we will look for evidence on things such as um, shops and where they're located and where people go to do their shopping. Uh, schools and other places of education and the communities they serve. Uh, residence associations um, and the communities uh, that they serve. Uh, sporting facilities, uh, how people use them, um, places of worship uh, where their congregations uh, are drawn from uh, across the city and telling us about how you use these kind of facilities, amenities and organisations and how relevant they are to your sense of place helps the Commission to understand where the communities exist and how to draw boundaries uh, that reflect them. Now, additionally, um, quite often, what looks like a dividing feature on a map, um, which we will get to look at, can actually be a uniting feature to a community um, that we do not know about because we are not present in the city. And I've got an example from a recent review here in Rochdale, so you can see um, the kind of uh, evidence that the Commission looks at as part of uh, its uh, reviews. So here on this map, um, there looks to be uh, what looks like a clear dividing line um, along the black boundary. Um, 
We didn't hear very much uh, from communities uh, during the first consultation in Rochdale. Um, so we went with the black line, which we thought was the stronger boundary as part of our proposals. However, what we heard during the second consultation was the exact opposite. Uh, local people wrote in to tell us uh, that these patches of land along the black boundaries did not separate the communities, but were actually uh, nature reserves that were a uniting uh, feature for people that lived on both sides of uh, the reserves. And uh, so our proposals had actually divided their sense of community. Uh, you can see here a few examples of the kind of things we were told um, with pictures of, of the nature reserve in question, uh, an online community that's dedicated to the, the preservation of the nature reserve. And as a result, uh, we were persuaded to change our draft recommendations to make sure we weren't splitting commu a community in our awarding proposals. And you can see the revised changes now. So these uh, Nature reserves are now wholly contained within wards. Um, so that's the kind of, that's just one example of the kind of community evidence that we're looking to receive in terms of um, uh, drawing up a set of recommendations for uh, Coventry. So the final criteria is uh, convenient and effective local government. Uh, we are looking for strong and identifiable boundaries that make sense on the ground uh, and for ones that make it as easy as possible for councillors to represent uh, their particular wards. And we're also looking for names that mean something to local people. So you can see here a good example of a strong and identifiable boundary. Uh, here you've got a motorway that's running right through uh, an authority area. And in this particular review, using this as a boundary here, provided for a good reflection of effective and convenient local government. So uh, any submissions you make to us should therefore consider uh, these three criteria. In particular, please tell us about your communities and how they are best reflected in the pattern of wards. Please give us a reason uh, for what you're proposing. If you want a particular boundary in a particular area, don't just tell us you want the boundary, tell us why you want the boundary. It's the why that is the most important. Just a quick note on the number of councillors uh, per ward. Um, as Coventry elects by thirds, um, the Commission must now have a presumption towards a uniform pattern of three member wards. Um, if the council were to elect in all our elections, there would be no presumption. Um, the commission can move away from a uniform pattern of three member wards. Um, if it transpires, we're unable to provide for a good balance of our statutory criteria uh, under a uniform pattern of three council awards. Under those circumstances, we could propose a mixed warding pattern in one or two areas in the city. However, this is quite rare and our starting point for the review will be that we will seek to deliver a uniform warding pattern of three member wards for Coventry. We have um, some very specific rules about uh, parishes during the electoral review. Um, and I know there are three parishes on the uh, edge of the city. We cannot create or abolish parishes as part of an electoral review. Um, that is always done by the local council itself as part of a community governance review, um, which again is, is solely the responsibility of the relevant uh, local authority. We also cannot amend any external boundaries of any parishes as part of this review. Again, that is something that can only be done locally through a community governance review. If we draw a ward boundary through a parish, we have to create a parish ward. Uh, this is what we mean by that. Uh, you can now see a parish on screen in uh, Hampshire. If we were to draw a new boundary through that parish in the way you see on screen now, we would need to create uh, a ward uh, on each side 
uh, to become parish wards. We will write to uh, every parish council at the start of each consultation stage as part of this review, um, as well as many other stakeholders, uh, including all uh, local representatives um, that we have had identified to us by uh, the City Council. So uh, I'm just going to now give you some common examples of arguments that we hear quite often, but that we cannot take into account. Uh, the Commission is not interested in which party would be elected in any ward uh, that it proposes or is proposed to it. Um, in most cases, uh, the map uh, across the city will have to change to accommodate um, either a different number of councillors, which at the moment is not the case in country, or to achieve electoral fairness. Uh, and the process is likely to have a knock-on effect across the council area. So what that means is uh, if your particular ward uh, isn't has electoral equality, it may still need to change to take account of neighbouring wards. Um, this means that the status quo is often not a viable option. Um, and the if it, it ain't broke, don't fix it argument uh, does not apply. We do not deal with parliamentary boundaries. Uh, they are dealt with under a separate set of rules and by a different body. Uh, and they build their parliamentary constituencies from our wards, and not the other way round. So we will not take into account any parliamentary boundaries when drawing up our wards. Um, there has recently been uh, a review of the parliamentary boundaries, and those boundaries for Coventry will have been drawn up by using the existing wards for the city. So when we can produce a new set of wards, they will only be used by the Parliamentary Commission at their next review. Um, our review doesn't change anyone's postcode, uh, it doesn't change anyone's postal address. Um, we have no evidence that it has any impact on house prices or insurance premiums. Um, and finally, uh, this review is only concerned with the internal uh, ward boundaries for Coventry. We're unable to amend uh, the external boundary of the city between uh, Coventry and any adjoining authority as part of this review. So that's phase two. And then phase three is the parliamentary process. Once we've completed the warding pattern phase and we've published final recommendations, we then turn them into law by presenting them to Parliament. We lay an order in both Houses of Parliament, the Commons and the Lords, for scrutiny. Once the order is laid, it goes through something called the draft negative resolution procedure. That means that the order will sit in Parliament for 40 days, and if there is no objection to it, it automatically becomes law. Parliament uh, can only reject or agree our recommendations. It can't make any amendments to them. Um, and none of our orders have been rejected by Parliament since the Local Government Boundary Commission was set up in 2010. If no objection is made, uh, then it will automatically become law. And then the final phase is implementation. Um, and the uh, new electoral arrangements will be implemented at a single all out election where all councillors are up for election in May of 2026. So just a brief overview of the full timetable so you can see the timescales of a review. So we've completed the preliminary process. The Commission has made its council size decision and we are now in our consultation on warding patterns. We then publish the draft recommendations at the end of October. We have a consultation on those proposals until January 2024. And then we publish final recommendations in May of 2024. The parliamentary process will then take place in the late spring to through to the late summer of 2024 for implementation in May of 2026.
there are a lot of ways to make a submission to the Commission over the course of our consultation period. Uh, you can email us, the email address on screen. Uh, you can send a postal submission uh, to uh, the Commission via our postal address. You can visit our website where you'll find um, a dedicated page for the Coventry Review, which has a easy to find link, which takes you to uh, a box where you can make your comments. There are also interactive maps um, on our website um, at the moment, just showing the existing wards. But once we publish proposals, you'll be able to see the draft proposals right down to street level. Um, we also post um, everything on social media, on Twitter and Facebook. Um, although we do not accept submissions made through Twitter or Facebook. Um, and you can uh, call us if you need to speak to us. But again, we don't take submissions by the phone, but you can call up and speak to someone if you have any questions you need answered. So that's basically the presentation. So I'd now be happy to take any questions anyone has. Um, I will just unshare the presentation and hopefully Liz can line up the questions for me and I will deal with them in turn. Uh, Councillor Actor, I think, first. Yeah, th thank you. Uh, sorry, I missed uh, a, a little part of the presentation due to a connection problem. But anyway, um, what is the maximum number uh, of the voters for, for each board? Is there any legal requirement to have a maximum number for, for, for each board? Sorry, I didn't catch that. A maximum number of? The voters. Electors. Elec electors. Electoral, yeah. yeah. Yes. So um, essentially um, what we do is um, we take uh, the uh, electric forecast that's been given to us by uh, Coventry. Um, which is published on our website, uh, we take the overall electorate for 2029, which is the year we're looking at. Uh, 2029 is five years from the end of the review, which is what the year we have to use legally under the legislation we operate on for uh, forecast electorates. So we take that forecast electorate, which is 249,249. We divide it by the number of uh, councillors we're proposing, which is the existing number 54, to come up with an average of 4,616 um, per councillor. So we then times that by three um, to make up uh, for each ward having uh, three councillors, uh, which gives us uh, a, a forecast of uh, 13,847 electors per three member ward. So we would be looking to propose wards that are within 10% of that figure, 13,847. And thank you. Councillor Ridley. Yeah, hi Mark, thanks for uh, your presentation this evening, um, really helpful. Just a couple of questions really. Um, first one is a very practical one, can we have a copy of those slides? I know that Liz is recording this, but it would be useful uh, to have a record of that. And secondly, just in terms of the actual format of any submissions that are, are, are being presented initially, from what I understand it, you will be producing a set of um, draft proposals uh, between the, I think it was the 31st to the 10th, which we will then comment on. So what do you actually want before that? Do you want individual, do you want comments about communities being linked together? Do you want a set of proposals from what do you actually want? So, um, yeah, so firstly, the slides will be sent around. I've already sent them over to Liz so she can circulate them afterwards. Um, there's also a, a briefing pack that uh, local councillors will have got at a previous um, presentation, which um, I can send round again, and you're, you're welcome to send that on to any uh, any people you know are interested in the review, which gives more detail on the review. Um, in terms of what we're looking for, so this consultation is where we're wanting people to give us evidence. In terms of the authority, uh, we'll be looking to receive a full set of draft proposals from Coventry, um, through your internal processes. In terms of local people, they can put in, you know, smaller submissions just on their particular area. Um, 
we accept submissions from anyone and they all carry equal weight. So um, we we know that um, there's sometimes councils can get agreements across the parties for a single um, set of warding proposals to submit to the commission. Sometimes they can't. Uh, so the individual political groups can submit their own proposals. Local councillors can submit their own proposals and views, local organisations, local residents. Um, but this is this is the consultation to do that. Um, and we will base our draft recommendations on what we receive. Yeah, OK, that's helpful. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Gray. There's my mic button. Um, two two questions. Um, one, uh, I know we we published the uh, electorate figures by polling district. Will those figures be available at a more granular level? Because obviously the polling districts might not be the best building blocks for uh, for the new wards. Um, certainly, we um, we publish them publicly by. Um, by polling district level, uh, from uh, as an organisation, we get um, an electoral register uh, from the council that's geocoded, so that, that each um, electoral property has um, a single point, which allows us to to go into to greater detail. Um, that's not something we can make publicly available, but um, there are. Um, there are kind of we, we use kind of geographical information system software to draw up the wards. There are free versions of that to use um, for uh, local representatives. Uh, we would we would hope that um, the the officers at the council work with um, local representatives to draw up any warding patterns um, locally. And um, I mean, I believe all uh, local authorities have uh, GIS capabilities to allow um, people to do that. In terms of in terms of um, ordinary members of the public, we find that um, the vast majority um, don't go down to the kind of granular level of being able to count exactly how many electors are in each ward they're proposing. However, what we are happy to do is if someone has a particular proposal and they want to know whether it works. Uh, we're more than happy, you know, if they want to contact us, um, provide us with what they're proposing, we can look and we can we can tell them whether um, what they're proposing actually works. Yeah. And uh, my other question is just a, a kind of technical bit that's more of a curiosity than a practical issue. Um, the the people listed as other electors who are in uh, allocated to awards but don't have an address probably because, because they, they live overseas, but they're still entitled to vote in the UK. How are they allocated to the new wards? Um, so we we have a forecast from, from the council for each ward. Um, the, what we're looking at is um, only the, the local government electorate. So uh, the electors we're counting are, are only electors that are eligible to vote in local government elections. Um, in terms of how um the council allocates them in the current electorate they've given to us um that's uh, a matter for the authority in terms of when we're proposing future wards uh we will look when we're proposing future wards to look at things like housing developments and try and and balance those so get an idea of um kind of where within wards housing developments lay. Uh, in terms of things like other electors, it may just be a case that if we're dividing a polling district, we may just need to uh, pro rata that between uh, the two or three wards that the, the polling district is divided between. To, to be fair, Mark, other electors are all linked to addresses. Anyway, that's how they it's identified yeah. which polling district they sit within. They have a link to an address within that area, and that's how they're allocated to a polling district. So, but you're right, okay. most of, most of the electors are not local government electors. There's only there's only a small number of them which are um, local government electors. Okay, uh, Councillor Boyle. 
Mark, within your process, uh, do you have the uh, plan to hold uh, public uh, hearings uh, and evidence taking hearings? And if so, what, what format do they take? Uh, we don't know. Um, public hearings are something that the Parliamentary Commission hold in terms of their evidence gathering. Um, our, this, this basically constitutes our, our public um, uh, consultation process that uh, this, this meeting, the invite for this meeting is, is open to, to all through dissemination by local councillors, local organisations. Um, and then uh, the consultation is then open and heavily publicised by ourselves through local media, social media, and also through working with the local authority um, to to get the message out there. We provide the council with, you know, posters, things to put up in libraries, things like that. Um, and we ask you as councillors to spread the message as well through your uh, contacts. Um, so that's exactly, that's essentially how the public a uh, consultation process works, but we're always eager to 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 get the message out to as many as possible. So if there's any, you know, any, anything you think we're missing, any particular groups, hard to reach groups, uh, we're always interested in getting the message out to those. So we're, we're more than happy to hear uh, information about how we're getting the message out and how we can better improve that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mutton. OK, thanks, Liz. Um, I mean, you said that, uh, you know, all submissions are, carry equal weight. But what happens when you've got opposing submissions? How do you decide who decides? Uh, we balance the evidence. Um, we have an internal process here where um, so if I've got if I've got computing submissions as the review officer, first and foremost, it's my decision so I will bounce the evidence I will present that um, through our internal process which essentially means that I present it to my manager and then I present it to our leadership team as part of our commission and then once the recommendations are agreed between the team working on them at the commission and the lead commissioner for the review so each review has a lead commissioner one of our six commissioners who will take a particular interest in this review and as I said, we'll come to the city and we'll look at any competing ones. So if we've got a competing submission, say one group says award. Uh, one group says this particular road forms a boundary. Another group says, no, it's not a boundary. It's the heart of the community. We will come and look at things like that. We will literally drive up the road. We will get out of the car. You know, we will look around and we will use that to make our decision making process. The final decision is made by the commission board as a collective. So they will agree the recommendations made to them by the review team that works on the review. And then we will publish a report which explains our rationale for every single decision we've made, which is publicly available. It goes on our website uh, alongside the map. So you, you literally will be able to scroll through the report as you get to a particular section, then the map will take you to that section. So you'll be able to see side by side the map and how we've come to the decision. And um, is there any appeals pro uh, process? You know, if a decision is made, is there an appeals process? So essentially, we hopefully will go through two consultation periods, which means that um, we come up with the best set of recommendations. We understand there will always be areas where there's disagreement, uh, but we will base our decision based on the evidence. If people aren't happy, um, we do have a complaints process, which eventually leads up to the local government ombudsman um, but we're hoping that by the time we've completed the process and considered all the evidence we've come up with a set of recommendations that uh, please as many people as we possibly can <laughs> okay thank you thank you uh, councillor blundell Ah, yes, uh, just there. Yes, um, I just want to go back to this business about equality of numbers, because I know I represent a ward which is currently uh, would, would would fall outside of those tolerance levels that you've put. So in order to do that, you've got to go down to individual polling districts. And it might be 
that uh, some of the polling districts, I know they vary in number per ward from five to maybe 10, something like that, or 12. So in, in the submission, it might be that we need to go down to the polling districts and move them into different wards or even split them up. So again, who's, where, where does that responsibility for the polling districts lie? Does it lie with yourself or does it lie with Coventry City Council within <coughs> each ward? So uh, as part of the review, it, it, it's, it's almost unheard of that we'll have a review where we don't split one of the existing polling districts because um, for the Commission, the polling districts are useful in terms of how they've been put together to uh, help electors uh, carry out the democratic process. But we don't necessarily agree that they're always reflective of the community. They're, they're often administrative units to allow the council to administer its elections. So there will be places where they will be divided um, in the new warding pattern. The process is that we will then divide them and as part of the implementation process at the end of the review, the, the council will then conduct a review of polling districts to basically then bring the new wards back into line with polling districts so they will redraw the polling district boundaries and maybe choose different polling places to reflect the new wards. In terms of dividing them, um, when putting in your submission you can uh, you can divide them, um, you don't necessarily have to know the exact numbers of the division you're making, you could just look at the map and say this is the line I want to do as part of the process, every submission I receive, I will check the figures myself anyway. So um, if you wanted to put an awarding pattern for, say, a particular area, you can just give us a map with the lines drawn on the map. We will put it into our software and we will look at what that does to the numbers. Uh, if you can do the numbers yourself, that's, uh, that's you know equally fine. But we will we will check them all anyway for whatever submission we receive, whether it's from a councillor, the council, a local organisation, or just a resident, they, they all get checked as part of the process anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Just to confirm, Councillor Brindell, obviously once, once the review, the Commission have completed their review, we will then, as an authority, have to conduct a full polling district and polling place review to, to, to review everything that is currently in place, because obviously it, it, it will change um, so, th so that will be conducted in the autumn of, of 2025, prior to the 2026 elections. Uh, Councillor Rowan. Thanks, Liz. Um, hi, Mark. Can you just briefly share the electoral figures, just the projections, and just give a brief example as to how you've, say, the first one, how you've arrived at Bab Lake, which I think is forecast... Uh, I think it's let's have a look. It's a plus thirty one percent. Yeah, so it's just <laughs> what's the cut off date in terms of uh, housing projections and things like that? Okay, and just let me share my screen because I have got it open. So this is this is the spreadsheet that is on uh, that's on our website now. Um, so this was drawn. Did you make that just a little bit bigger, just so everybody can see it. Uh, I can only share. I'm okay. essentially sh I'm essentially sharing my window, so uh, that's I don't know how how it will display on people's screens, but that's that's essentially the pro forma. So that was drawn up with officers at the council. That's now been submitted. So the cutoff for the forecasts is done. Um, you can see each uh, each ward has the current electorate as of 2023 and a forecast for 2029. Um, those forecasts take account of um, housing development across uh, the five years uh, up until the end of the uh, 2029. Uh, it will take account of things like registration rates. It will take account of just natural churn. Um, and uh, like I said, the officers of the council have pulled that together. Uh, we, we have then looked at it. Uh, we are content that this set of figures is the most robust for this review. And so these are the set of figures that the entire review will be based on. What we do say is if you do spot uh, an obvious thing, something you think is an obvious area, you can contact us and you can flag that to us and we will look at it. We will probably go back to the officers of the council and say this has been flagged to us and ask uh, for 
uh, any further information we get to see. Um, but essentially, this is the set of figures that will um, be used for the entirety of the review. OK, that's great. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Singh. Oh, uh, uh, thank you. So um, if you can look at that table, if you can show that table again, that spreadsheet. Mark. And then, um, so um, the housing developments accounted for in Bablet Ward. Um, it's probably my geographical knowledge uh, and maybe colleagues can help me, but you know, the big Eastern green development, the, the, which ward will that fall in? Woodlands or? It's, it's Bab Lake, Bally. It's Bab Lake. Okay. So that's where the big increase is. Yeah. Okay. Understood. Okay. Uh, Councillor Gray, you've still got your hand up. Is that a legacy hand? Um, OK, um, I've got no more hands up. I don't know whether there's any other other questions for for Mark. Uh, Councillor Joe Barr. Thank you, Liz. Uh, just a quick question, Mark. So in terms of uh, the size of the council, the number of councillors, uh, it will remain the same. Is that final or there may be uh, a change? Thank you. So so um, our decision on council size is what we call a minded to decision. Um, so it won't be final until we publish the final recommendations. It could change um, if someone was to show us um, a awarding pattern that worked on a different number um, that had stronger evidence than 54, uh, then the commission could be persuaded to use that. What I'd say is in councils that elect by thirds, that's more unlikely because uh, we say that the agreed number can change by one or two if a warding pattern uh, emerges that's better. Uh, it's very unusual that a warding pattern emerges that changes it by three, which is what would be needed in an authority that elects by thirds, unless we were to propose wards that didn't have three councillors, which, as I said in the presentation, is not our starting point. We would only do that with sufficiently strong evidence and it has to be very strong evidence um, to override the effective and convenient local government that electing by thirds carries. Um, so the answer is it's not certain um, until the final recommendations, but also it's quite unusual if it to change by one or two in an authority that elects by thirds and even more unusual for it to changed by a full three in authorities that are elect by thirds. Thank you. Councillor McNicholas. Here we go. Mark, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I represent Lower Stoke. Now, from your chart, it is plus 20 percent. Now, in order to achieve the median, there's going to have to be a substantial drop in the number of electors. Um, you were talking in terms of polling district. I'm thinking in terms of we'd need to lose at least one box in order to achieve that median. So in practical terms, um how is that going to be done because it will have a significant impact on adjacent wards uh, indeed i mean it's it's very difficult to look at uh, a review in isolation so um based on the uh, forecast figures there are seven wards that are outside the 10 percent um variance there are others that are close to it but um in in terms of this you need to think of it as the city as a whole. So um, we will make changes across the whole city to uh, to achieve electoral equality um, for the city, whilst also attempting to reflect the local communities um, 
and use identifiable boundaries. So that is what we're that is what this consultation is hoping to achieve is for you as an authority and you as individual councillors uh, within your groups, within your organisations to tell us where you think the boundaries should be. So if you're looking at Lower Stoke, um, so it has too many electors at the moment, so it will need to have fewer electors. So tell us which electors you think should be moved out of Lower Stoke uh, and ideally tell us where they should be moved to and tell us what the boundary uh, should be. That's that's the, that's what we're looking for during this consultation. Uh, we have it ready. Thank you very much. So, Joe Boris, have you got another question or is that just legacy hand? Okay, I can't see any other hands then. So, um, if there's no more more questions or queries. Hi, Liz. I have a, a question, but I could have put my hand up on the. Okay, Councillor Singh. So it's probably uh, um, whether you can help me. Um, so the current public ward boundaries, does that um, uh, it also has Orsley Parish Council boundary? Is that right, correct? That's right, yes. Yes. You've got um, Orsley and Kersley within Bublake Ward at the moment. Yeah. So uh, those two parish councils can't have their uh, boundaries amended, uh, according to uh, Mark. Uh, so they'll have to, you know, ideally they'll have to remain integral. So does the Eastern Green development fall in the parish boundaries or not? It does, yes. But what, what Mark's, but what Mark said is that the parish doesn't have to be contained within one ward. If right. it went across two wards, what would have to happen is the parish would have to be warded. Right, so there'd have to be two parish councils. No, it would be one parish council. But the parish yeah. would have two wards. So like the city council has got 18 wards, yeah, yeah. the parish council would have two wards. One ward would be within one city ward and one, one ward of the parish would be in the other city ward. Oh, in yeah. Yeah. Right. And, we, yeah. and we, we, would look at the, we would look at the division we, uh, if a parish does need to be divided uh, and so where, where a housing development is crossing into a parish is a good example of where it might end up being divided. We would look at the division. We would provide parish wards. Uh, we would name those parish wards. Um, obviously, those names would be subject to consultation. So if you didn't like them, you could um, you could propose different names. Or uh, if you know, if you wanted to propose a division of the parish yourself, you can do that and propose names. Uh, we would also propose uh, the correct number of parish councillors for each ward so we would we don't we don't change the overall number of parish councillors for the parish council so that would remain the same but we would divide them between um, the wards depending on the electorates for those wards based on the 2029 figure. Okay. Councillor Lancaster. Thanks, Liz. Um, Kersley Parish Council is cross boundary between Holbrooks and Bablake, I understand. So that shouldn't be a problem with the Orsley Parish Council, should it? No, it's not. It's not a problem. It, I think Kersley does fall to wholly within Bablake. No, it doesn't. It includes Watery Lane and um, Edward Road and parts, and that that's part of Kersley Parish. I'd need to review the, the, the maps because I don't think that's reflected on the maps at the present time. But any any other other queries, questions? No, okay. So, so Mark, the the next basically the next stage is that you await submissions and yep. during the consultation period. Yeah. So just just to sum up. It was it was nice to to meet everybody. The consultation is now open. If you go to the local government boundary website, lgbc.org.uk, you'll find a page for Coventry. You can see all the material that's already on there. There's posters on there. 
that you can send round, that you can download them to email them out to people. Uh, there's the electric figures, there's maps of the existing wards, so you can see the existing ward in pattern, but I presume you are well aware of that, but you can you can look at that, you can use that map to try and figure out where you'd like new ward boundaries to be. And then there's a form that you can submit any submissions to us through that. Um, so yeah, I'd encourage you all to go and have a look and, and get that message out to uh, the people you represent and other people in your community organisations, people you know, neighbours, just tell everyone about the review and we look forward to reading all the submissions. OK, thank, thank you, everybody. Have a have a good evening. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.